Um, so I'm Meg Phillips. Um, I am an archivist and records manager by training, but I am currently in a communications role for the for the National Archives and Records Administration um, with the position title external affairs liaison. Um, so talking to people like you about your concerns and making sure that you have good information about how the National Archives works is a big part of my job. Um, but the other part of my job is, is listening, um, trying to figure out what people are worried about and what we might be able to do to, to help or to at least ad address people's questions head on. So um, I think that I have about half an hour of content. And um, again, I cannot see chat very well. Um, I can kind of tell if there's activity there. But um, Sheila, if you can interrupt me if there's anything pressing or if I need to wrap it up, just, just go ahead and, and break in there. OK, um, so what I've chosen, excellent. So what I've chosen to focus on today is NARA's um, laws access to records under those laws and public involvement in decision making at NARA. So those seem to be the topics that were most uh, relevant to the concerns of this group. Um, but the intention is really to lay a groundwork of good understanding of how the National Archives functions. And then if there are areas that you want to drill down even deeper on, you can let me know and we can schedule a uh, visiting expert um, for some future presentation if you choose to do that. So that's an option that's available to you. Um, so in addition to the, the laws and how those affect access and pub public involvement and decision making, um, I really want you to understand sort of the underlying processes and what they look like when they're working properly and also where the public has an opportunity to, to weigh in or to get further information about those processes. So that's really part of the part of the point. Um, So I think most of you probably don't work for government. A lot of you are in academic libraries. And it's hard to overstate how important our founding laws are. Um, the government cannot do things because we feel like it. We really have to be authorized to do those things by um, our laws and regulations. So the, it may seem extremely legalistic <laughs> the way I'm covering this, but it really matters. Um, and it makes a difference for what records um, you can you can get easy access to. Okay, so um, the National Archives um, holds the historically valuable records of the federal government of the United States of America. So these are, this is kind of basic information. Most of you already know this, but I need to make sure that the groundwork is shared on a uh, shared understanding. So other levels of government manage their own records and generally have their own archives. So every U.S. state and territory, many cities, counties tribes have archives of their own. Uh, the National Archives is not legally responsible for any of those records or those institutions, although we all share information through networks and associations of archivists. Um, so I point this out largely because it's a really fundamental point about what records the archives has and what records it doesn't have. Um, and also because the system of archives management is really different in other countries. So if you're coming from the UK or Canada or Germany, it really looks different. So I emphasize um, the federal government of the United States is, is the records that we're concerned about here. So the National Archives holds records from all three branches of the federal government, um, but which records we have and the timeline and the process for access depends on when the records were created, the part of government that created them, and the legal framework that governs them. So um, when the records were created, you have to keep in mind that NARA wasn't founded until 1934. We didn't have a building to move into until 1935. So those first archivists at NARA were going backwards and trying to figure out what had survived. Um, so that matters. Actually, looking at this slide, this is a digression. Um, I had to migrate my slides into another program, and it added an awful lot of bullets that were not originally there. So I apologize for the, the polka dotted effect of these slides. Um, so the, the, the laws that govern most of the records that come in um, are the Federal Records Act as amended. And the Federal Records Act wasn't passed until 1950. So again, for those first um, couple of decades, um, things were, it, it was just a, a, 
treasure hunt, basically, to see what of historic value had survived and should be brought into the National Archives. So, so what time period you're talking about with that. Okay, so now we're gonna start a little tour of the branches of government and how NARA gets records from each of those branches. Um, different laws cover different records. So we're gonna start in the executive branch because that's where most of our records come from and it's the most complex. The Federal Records Act, starting in 1950, covers most of the executive branch um, and it affects other branches too. Um, the law governs how federal government records are handled and which ones can be found in the archives. Um, so it covers the main body of government, um, all the departments and agencies that get the real work of government done. However, um, the tops of each branch of government are generally not covered by the Federal Records Act. So the top of each branch is its own little exception. Um, they have their own record keeping arrangements and we'll cover those in a moment. But generally, it's safe to assume that most other records are covered by the Federal Records Act and the processes it lays out. And we're going to go into those processes in some detail um, later in the presentation. So just some random examples of the types of records that we might get. Um, what's on this slide is a U.S. Coast Guard um, lighthouse record. And um, it's just one example of many, many types of federal government records that, that have been created. Um, by these agencies. So the key thing to remember is that these agencies are generating a lot of records. So many that the agencies felt overwhelmed um, by the amount of paper building up. They needed a responsible and legal way to dispose of obsolete records that didn't have any continuing value. And at the same time, identify the records that did have enough historical value that they should go to the archives. So the Federal Records Act established the process of federal records management, which is that set of rules and processes agencies use to work with the National Archives to identify the small percentage of records that are valuable enough to send to the archives and, and, and keep forever once the agencies are done with us. So again, we'll go over that in more detail later. Okay. Um, so at the top of the executive branch, again, the pattern is there's always an exception at the top of the branch. And presidential records are their own story, and they're complicated even within the category of presidential records. Um, the legal framework for presidential records changed pretty dramatically over time. So we're gonna let's spend a moment just going over the different legal environments that cover different presidents' records. Um, and I'll just interrupt myself to say that the, the image that you're looking at is uh, taken from NARA's website, where you can click through to the presidential libraries of all of those presidents, including um, the beginning stub of the all virtual Barack Obama library. So starting with George Washington and going up through Jimmy Carter, the papers of the presidents are considered personal property. Many of the president's records ended up in the Library of Congress or university libraries. And again, until 1934, there was no National Archives to collect them. But President Franklin Roosevelt, still considering presidential papers as personal property, but actually really interested in the new National Archives project, had the first idea for a presidential library as we know it today. Roosevelt set up the model of building at his own expense a library building and donating it to the National Archives, <coughs> excuse me, and then donating the papers that documented his presidency, um, donating the records to the people of the United States. So you can hear the stress on donated there. The National Archives actually holds the records of presidents and their White House staff going back to President Hoover. Um, Hoover was paying attention when FDR did all this, and he thought it was a great idea, so he did the same thing. So he um, did it after FDR, but he was the earlier president. So if you happen to be looking for the papers of earlier presidents, pre-Hoover, um, the Library of Congress is an excellent place to start. There's some records on in universities. And there's also Founders Online, which I have to mention, give a little plug to Founders Online, because the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, which is NARA's grant-making arm, um, funded and supports Founders Online. And it really is a wonderful resource for um, records from many sources for the early, early presidents. Okay, the tradition of presidential papers as private property, unless the president could choose to donate to the National Archives, started to look like a really, really bad idea after Watergate. Um, the Watergate crisis really highlighted the need to change the way the government and 
and just the United States thought about presidential records. So at that point, Congress took action um, and passed the Presidential Records Act. Um, this is the other big branch of NARA's legislation. So the Presidential Records Act declares that presidential records are government property rather than personal property. So the public actually has the legal right to access these records as outlined by the rules in the Presidential Records Act and the Freedom of Information Act. So um, the Freedom of Information Act is actually one of our major legislations that govern um, access to these records. So under the Presidential Records Act, essentially all the records created by a president and his staff in the process of performing his presidential duties become part of the permanent archival collection at the National Archives. And they come, they, they magically switch over on the last day of the administration. So that happens regardless. It happens no matter what the president does, whether the president chooses to start a foundation and do fundraising, whether the foundation foundation chooses to build a building and donate to the National Archives, the legal situation doesn't change at all. Um, the Presidential Records Act is still fully in force, um, so the records become the legal property of the National Archives. Um, so just keep in mind that that situation is really, really different from the tiny percentage of federal records created by most agencies that are appraised as permanent and transferred to the National Archives. Um, it's a really important distinction. So in most cases, we're getting a tiny fraction. For presidential records, we get everything. So Reagan is on this slide with a bunch of extra bullets um, because Reagan is an important dividing line. His was the first presidency under the Presidential Records Act. Earlier libraries are what we call deed of gift libraries because in those cases, the president donated his records. And the president had a lot of control over what he chose to give, what access restrictions were on those records. It's like any other um, donation agreement to a, to a library or archive. So Nixon's records are also their own little category. They're covered by their own law because Congress seized Nixon's records by passing the, what's called the Presidential Records, uh, Presidential Recordings and Materials Preservation Act. So Nixon is his own special thing. So given those, that change over time and the you know, critical moment of Watergate, that means that the broad category of presidential records, even the ones just held by NARA, are governed by three totally different, um, I'll say, legal frameworks or legal arrangements. They're the um, deed of gift libraries, there's Nixon himself, and then there's the Presidential Records Act libraries. And it's the Presidential Records Act that we're still living under today. Okay, uh, finally leaving the executive branch and going into the judicial branch, um, yet again, the top level is handled differently um, from ordinary levels of government. So the Supreme Court is not required to transfer records to the National Archives, um, but they do transfer records to NARA um, on a voluntary basis. So there's no law covering Supreme Court records, um, but they do transfer records. Um, those records are open, unless they're sealed by the court or unless they contain grand jury material. Lower federal courts um, are subject to the Federal Records Act, but not subject to FOIA. And I'm, I'm sure that in this community, um, I can slip into the jargon of calling the Freedom of Information Act FOIA. It seems like um, something that you all have in your, in your toolkit already. So lower federal court records are open um, unless specifically sealed or unless they contain grand jury material. And judicial branch organizations, um, which are federal agencies basically, but they're things like the administrative office of the U.S. courts, are subject to the Federal Records Act, but not to FOIA. And those records are open under NARA's general restrictions. And again, we're speeding way up across our branches of government after the executive branch. So moving on to the legislative branch, um, yet again, the head of the branch is not covered by the normal record keeping law. The records of Congress are not covered by the Federal Records Act, but Congress does send records to NARA regularly for preservation and access. NARA never takes ownership of those records, and Congress can request them back if it needs them. Um, the Center for Legislative Archives at NARA holds the historically valuable records of the House of Representatives and the Senate, including official committee records but all of them remain the legal property of the House and the Senate. 
Um, so the Center for Legislative Archives applies the rules of access for congressional records, which are determined by the House and the Senate. So again, I'm trying to kind of explain what the access situation is for each of these categories of records, but I'm, I'm going really fast. Um, so the rules of access are determined by the House and the Senate, but they are available online. You can read about what those rules are. Now, again, you probably know this already, but the records of individual members of Congress do not come to the National Archives. They are still considered private property, and the members can do whatever they want with them. They can donate them to their alma mater, which often happens, or another repository, or honestly, they can burn them in the trash. It's perfectly legal. Um, the legislative branch includes organizations besides Congress itself, of course. Um, so some examples are the Government Accountability Office, or GAO, and our our, our good buddy, the Library of Congress, both legislative branch agencies. And those are covered by the Federal Records Act, like similar agencies in the executive branch. Okay, so um, NARA's goal is to uh, provide access to all these records. We're taking them in in order to provide access to the public. Um, we continue to accession or receive new records from all branches of the federal government um, within the constraints set by all these different legal frameworks. So you really want to know where you are and which framework applies to the records that you might be interested in. So the big ones are the Federal Records Act and the Presidential Records Act. We talk about those all the time, but access is also determined by donor agreements with the pre-PRA, Presidential Records Act presidents, and also the transfer arrangements with the Supreme Court and Congress. Again, no law, just a little kind of casual agreement. So we have to follow these laws. Um, and part of the purpose of the laws is to balance the open access with um, protecting privacy and other rights that compete with open access, um, like national security. So the National Archives does accession classified records um, we run the National Declassification Center, which is an entirely different conversation. If you want to go in that direction, just let me know. Um, but we have to respect those laws and respect all the agreements that we've made with people who donated the records voluntarily. So I'm skipping over a ton of detail here. Um, for example, there are actually donated materials in um, other parts of the National Archives besides the libraries, but this is the key stuff you need to know. So that is your general tour of the branches of branches of government and which records come to the National Archives and what rules are in place to, to get access to them. So if you're knowledgeable about the basics of these laws, you'll have a big head start in figuring out what's supposed to happen, what it, what it looks like when things are going right, and um, where the leverage is if things are going wrong. If there's actually a law that applies or if you might think that the law is inadequate or um, whatever. You need to know what the actual current situation is. Okay, <laughs> so that was all um, general background that I think anybody interested in um, federal government information should, should have a basic grip on. Um, but now we're going to spend a few minutes taking a deeper dive into federal records under the Federal Records Act, because again, I think it's really important to know what this process is supposed to achieve from the government's point of view, why it works the way it does. And also, this is the place where the public and you in your um, uh, activist, wearing your activist hat, can actually uh, participate in the process. So it's also important that the Federal Records Act is the, the domain that covers most of the government. So first of all, this is most of the records. But it's also the only place where NARA actually controls the process. So we have the right to go into agencies and evaluate how well they're doing and um, make sure that they have the right records management processes in place. We do not have that authority for presidential records, congressional records, um, or court records. So um, we have some influence, but we have no control. <laughs> so that's an important distinction as well. Um, so you, you intervene where you can, and the Federal Records Act is where you can. Okay, so um, before the Federal Records Act in 1950, um, 
which established these records management processes that we're going to talk about, um, agencies did not always take good care of their records. Um, the, what, what's on this slide now are War Department records stored in the White House garage, and the picture was taken in 1935. And so those early archivists at NARA who were going out to see what, what existed and what should be brought into the National Archives, this is the kind of stuff they were finding. It's a little harder to show visually what poorly organized, poorly cared for electronic records look like, um, but the risk of neglect and disorder is essentially the same, except the digital records are actually less likely to survive long-term um, without proper preservation, description, maintenance, and you know, people to take care of the systems that store them, and presumably without eventual migration of the formats um, that they're recorded in. So in either an analog or a digital world, if you keep everything, it's much harder to find what you need, and it's expensive to store and protect everything you've got. So once upon a time, most of the records were paper, but now almost all the records are electronic, and the National Archives is actively assisting agencies to move to entirely electronic record keeping. And that process is a whole other conversation that we could have if you're interested in it. Um, regardless, paper analog um, or digital, the basic problem is the same. From the agency's point of view, there's just way too much of it. It's really hard to keep track of where it is. It's hard to find information um, that the agencies need and be sure that it's current. It's expensive to store it. And it's riddled with information that needs special security protection, um, like the Privacy Act, um, uh, PII. Um, and yet the agencies need to be able to respond to Freedom of Information Act requests for any records they have related to a request. So the more that the agencies have, the slower and harder it, harder it is to sort through everything they've got um, for the information that's current, that's relevant, and that's legal for us to release. So that's basically the, the, the benefit that agencies get from um, the federal records management process. So this is a very old cartoon <laughs> trying to capture the basic steps of federal records management in the records life cycle. So Congress passed the original Federal Records Act in 1950, which was after the expansion of government in World War II and the New Deal. And the goal was to give the government a standard process for sifting the wheat from the chaff um, and allow it in a legal way to regularly get rid of low value records that were just getting in the way. Um, but only after all needs for them had expired. And the other big goal of the Federal Records Act is allowing the National Archives to identify the records that are important enough to preserve for posterity. So the Federal Records Act, Act says that every federal agency must establish and maintain a records management program. Records management is defined as the planning, controlling, directing, organizing, training, promoting, and all the other managerial activities related to creating records, maintaining and using records, and the disposition of records. So disposition is a term of art for us, and it's disposing of records, either by destroying them or by transferring them to the National Archives, or in some cases donating them somewhere else, although that's not super common. And under the Federal Records Act, NARA has the authority and the responsibility to help federal agencies manage their records. So the details of all, how all of this works are in NARA's regulations at 36 CFR, Chapter 12. And the purpose of records management in general is to give agencies a reliable way to determine what they have, where it is, what security controls it needs, how long it needs to be kept in order, um, and so this is, this is a list that we come back to at NARA again and again, how long records need to be kept to fulfill the agency's own information needs, their main mission, how long they need to be kept to protect citizen rights, um, how long they need to be kept to provide government accountability, and um, to fulfill any legal or regulatory requirements. So for example, if there's a, um, a, a time period when records are, are vulnerable to audit, like your tax returns, for example, um, they have to be kept that long. Um, if there's a statute of limitations, they need to be kept for that long. And so the last goal, of records management is, is identifying whether or not the National Archives should preserve some, some records forever. And the 1950 law and all of its amendments after that put the National Archives in charge 
of administering this new federal records management process to determine what should be kept and what should be thrown away. Um, and this really was kind of the beginning of records management. Like the federal government got so big and unwieldy at this point, and it was so hard to manage all the paper that built up that they had to essentially invent a whole new discipline that is now spread all over the world and in all kinds of organizations. Okay, so why should agencies destroy most of their old records? Keeping everything has real costs for them. Um, it's, we're spending taxpayer dollars, we're spending staff time and energy, and um, we have to provide security for the information on needed records while also providing access to them in response to FOIA. And this is sort of still in the agency that we're talking about. And for most government records, the cost is just not worth um, the benefit. So if you think about the types of records that commonly accumulate in agencies, there are things like travel vouchers and purchase orders for pens or computers or web design services. There are notes from internal project meetings for the routine business of all the different offices. And most of these actually have value for a very short time. And usually the time in which the project that they're related to is ongoing or a problem might still be discovered and need to be investigated and fixed. Um, but eventually most of these records can be destroyed and they might be kept for three years or seven years or 50 years. That's still temporary retention. Um, but they probably don't need to be kept for 100 years or forever. So the National Archives is in the business of forever. Um, so we are very selective about what records we can consider to be worth our time and energy accessioning and describing and preserving and providing access to um, because all of that um, takes resources and work. And um, if you've got the wrong stuff, you're just slowing yourself down, basically. Um, more recently, we're getting this question about why we can't just keep everything. It's coming up more and more now that we're in a digital record keeping world. And we do not aspire to keep everything. Um, we do not think that that's a good thing um, because the cost of preserving and providing access to all the stuff is just too, too great for us to handle. And it may partly be a technology thing, like we don't currently have the technology that would make it easy to find exactly the right digital document or email or PowerPoint slide among an agency's millions and millions and millions of digital records. And again, we have to fully protect and review for privacy information anything that we've got. So at the moment, we really can't automate those tasks. And we want to focus our energy on safeguarding and providing access to only the records that um, we're really confident have historical value and that are necessary to protect rights and provide government accountability on an ongoing permanent basis. Okay, so this is a couple of process slides here. So how do agencies request permission to destroy records? They request permission by sub submitting a proposed record schedule or a records retention schedule to the National Archives. The schedule describes groups of records, types of records that have something in common and proposes the length of time that the agency thinks they should be kept um, based on all those things that we talked about before. Most temporary records are destroyed, but donation is also a possibility. So who can give agencies permission to destroy their records um, or to transfer to the archives? Um, so, the Archivist of the United States is the short answer to that question, but National Archives appraisal archivists appraise the records on the schedule to see if they agree with the proposed disposition that comes from the agencies. Um, they often go look at the records, they analyze other schedules that are related, they look at how those records relate to other things that might have more, um, a more digestible form of the information. So if things get rolled up into a report that's just easier to, to understand and manage, they might authorize disposition of even very important information if there's just an, another way of getting access to that that they think is easier for researchers. So if a schedule contains temporary records, records proposed for destruction, a notice of the proposed schedule is posted in the federal register. Um, if, if all the records are permanent, it actually does not need to be posted in the federal register because we assume that the risk of destroying records inappropriately is much lower. Um, and to guide decision making about what has permanent value and should come to the archives, NARA uses an appraisal policy, um, which is available on our website. So if you want the link to that, I can send you the link. Okay. Um, 
So, <laughs> um, does the public have a chance to weigh in on which records are kept forever and which ones are destroyed and when they're destroyed? And the answer is absolutely. Um, anytime an agency proposes records for destruction, we solicit comments in the Federal Register. So you can monitor the Federal Register at federalregister.gov. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see what those notices actually look like. The important thing to know here is that um, since um, just for the last couple of months, we made an important change to this process. Um, and now the full proposed schedules and the appraisal reports are posted at the same time the Federal Register notice goes out, and they're posted at regulations.gov, and comments can be submitted online in regulations.gov. So that process used to be harder, um, harder to get the full schedules. You had to actually ask for them. So this is a really important um, uh, improvement in transparency and usability for, for public comment from, from our point of view. We hope that it is. And I want to use this opportunity to announce that we are going to host a completely public, um, anybody can join webinar on this process, on, on commenting on Federal Register, uh, I'm sorry, using the Federal Register and regulations.gov to review proposed schedules and to submit comments. And so we're gonna go over the change to the process, why we changed the process, talk about you know, exactly how you use the new um, platform. And we'll take comments and answer questions, and um, we'll see what you think. So that is scheduled for May 30th. And as soon as I have the connection information for the webinar, I'm going to send it out to the DLF list so you all will get that. And I really hope that you'll uh, participate in that webinar because I think it's going to be um, the beginning of a helpful discussion about the process itself for soliciting public comment. That's an area where NARA has gotten a lot more attention in the last couple of years. So we're really glad that we're able to make that process a bit easier. So this is what the Federal Register page looks like. Um, on the top level Federal Register site, you can search for the words National Archives Record Schedules and see the most recent notices. Um, you can also sign up for notifications anytime NARA posts a schedule. So it's relatively usable. Okay. Um, so when should an agency actually destroy its records? So agencies are authorized to destroy or otherwise dispose of their records covered by a temporary record schedule, as long as the schedule is approved and signed by the Archivist of the United States, and the records that they're talking about have been kept the approved length of time required by the schedule or by the general record schedules. But once those records have been kept the required length of time, they have reached their disposition date and the agency is actually expected um, to get rid of them on a regular rolling schedule, um, different use of the word schedule, on a, on a regular basis. Um, and the, the key thing is that it should be regular and it should be a routine part of their information management activities. So do the records laws, this is actually both Federal Records Act and Presidential Records Act, do they apply to records in all formats? Absolutely. Um, the def definition of a record includes all recorded information, regardless of physical form or characteristics, made or received by the U.S. government under federal law. And the amendments to both Federal Records Act and Presidential Records Act, the amendments of 2014, further clarified that, although the National Archives already interpreted it to mean electronic records. So all agency records have to be scheduled. Um, NAR does make this easier for some categories of kind of obviously temporary records by issuing general record schedules that any agency can use, and those are also clearly available on the website. Those are things like travel records, maintenance records, timesheets, HR records, that kind of stuff. Okay, and this is just a reminder. We're looping back around to the beginning. Are there any exceptions? Yes, and the Presidential Records Act is an exception. All records created by the president um, are permanent and just automatically transfer to the National Archives at the end of the administration, and Congress and the Supreme Court have their own transfer agreement. Okay, so this is another thing that's really important for you to know, and I think that it's a lesser known fact, and it's potentially really important. If you're interested in finding out more about what agencies are doing with their records, and also just what information they're creating and how long it's being kept, 
going to the repository of all the approved record schedules. And that covers the temporary stuff, the permanent stuff, all of it, going back through time, is available on NARA's website um, in this records control schedule repository. So this site allows you to browse by agency, by department, um, and search for recently approved schedules and search by keyword. Um, however, it's important to note that the underlying schedules are in most cases just scans of really old paper forms. And those forms were not designed for you. Uh, they were designed to support this federal records management process and they're used by people who kind of speak the same jargon. So they're not, um, if it were a research tool designed for researchers, it would look different. Um, so these are real records of a, of a you know, government function. However, if you're interested in federal government information and you want a map of the whole universe of what information the federal government creates, this is as close as there is at the moment. Okay, um, so in some ways, this is a very heart of the matter. How can you tell if a record's destruction is appropriate? Appropriate destruction of federal records has predictable characteristics. The destruction is routine. It's done on a regular schedule as a normal part of business, and it is not done, you know, just once in a blue moon under crisis conditions. It's not done in the middle of the night. Um, and the agency should be able to point to the record schedule that covered the records and authorize their destruction at that moment. And then you should be able to look up that schedule. Um, so that's what the process looks like when it's going right. However, unauthorized destruction can happen and does happen. And you should suspect it if the records are destroyed, you know, in the opposite way, not in the regular course of business, not covered by an approved record schedule, or despite being subject to a, a, a records freeze because of pending or ongoing litigation. Okay, um, there is, if you, Given all that, if you genuinely suspect that federal records are being destroyed or disposed of, meaning um, alienated, basically given to somebody outside the government in a way that's inappropriate, we want you to report it to the National Archives. And there's an email address where you can report that at unauthorized disposition at nona.gov. And <laughs> the unauthorized disposition um, function has a fairly new website, and this is part of NARA's own. Uh, attempt to improve transparency about our own processes, that we started posting all of the reported um, instances of unauthorized disposition, along with copies of the letters that we sent to agencies to follow up, and the final letter resolving it. Um, so all of that is available on our website. So, um, to wrap up here, I know I've gone on much longer than I was supposed to here. Um, the government actually should destroy most of its information eventually, and they keep it for as long as it should be kept um, under the Federal Records Act. But sometimes it must not destroy its information, but has to send its records to the National Archives. So the goal of this presentation is to help you recognize um, why that works the way it works, um, what the agencies are trying to get out of it, um, how you can tell the difference between good records management, which we consider to be an asset, and inappropriate unauthorized disposition, and what you can do about it. Um, and you, I hope, also have a sense of what NARA's authority is and how it's different for different categories of records. And that's all I've got. <laughs> I'm afraid I talked much too long, so thank you. No, Meg, you didn't. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, it was a really great overview, and I learned a lot. I did not know, um, which <clears throat> I, I'm not, that just might be me. I might, but um, that was so helpful. So thank you. Um, do people have questions for Meg, um, either about um, the law, you know, what she talked about, what the laws that um, are, the National Archives are covered under, um, or some of the um, record schedules and how that is. Um, how that is handled by the National Archives. Um, I guess, Meg, I'll start since I've, um, uh, the, the question, the comment that you made about FOIA, that FOIA does not apply to all government records. Can you talk a little bit, of, uh, a little bit more about that? <laughs> 
like it, it applies to FOIA of reply, applies to presidential records, but not to the Federal Records Act. And what does it mean mm -hmm. when it says doesn't apply? Okay, so um, it does apply to records covered by the Federal Records Act, and it does apply in kind of a special way to presidential records. Um, so a major deadline for the National Archives is five years after the end of an administration, which is the first date on which the public can file a FOIA request for presidential records. And so it really okay. drives the development of um, our processes for that um, presidential library. Like we're trying to either anticipate what's going to get FOIA'd first um, or whatever. So the, the most important, this is just like how government really works in the real world. So Congress is passing these laws. There is no law governing the records of Congress. There's no right to FOIA for the records of Congress because Congress is in charge. Congress is writing the rules, right? So it's actually kind of logical in that way. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's, I think, similar. I actually know much less about judicial branch records, but I think it's kind of a similar thing because there's no law they don't have to transfer the, to them, uh, transfer the records to NARA at all. And so they don't have the same um, sort of access requirements that records that are covered by these laws, uh, federal records and presidential records are. And so does the, does the national, uh, sorry, the declassification center, is that who, like if you FOIA something and it's classified, it goes to the declassification center to find out if it can be opened in response to your FOIA? Um, I will confess that exactly how that works is a little bit beyond my expertise, but I think that's roughly right. You do have the right to file a FOIA for classified information. Um, if it is properly still classified, they will keep it closed, but if they can open it, they will try to do that. And I mean, if people are interested, that the, the people at the National Declassification Center have what I think is a fabulous motto, which is um, releasing all we can, protecting what we must. Mm. And so they also have a real access mentality. And the, the NARA staff at the National Declassification Center their primary job is coordinating representatives from all these other agencies, the CIA, the Air Force, you know, FBI, and getting them to agree that a record is, can be declassified and making them sit down at the same time and talk to each other. Um, so they, they make sure that the process happens and that the records that are 25 years old, which is how long classification lasts, um, are looked at and released if they can be. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Anybody else with a question for Meg? We're, we're running short on time, um, but Meg, your presentation was great, so I, I appreciate you taking really taking the time to delve us into that. Um, I wasn't sure if any of the subcommittees had updates that they wanted to do. Um, uh, the um, advocacy, outreach, education, logistics, or whether there might be more questions for Meg. We have sort of like five minutes left so we can use it however people would most like to use it. I guess the only um, subcommittee update I know is the um, logistics subcommittee who made a note in the notes that they're very sorry about all of us dropping the ball on the March meeting. So we apologize for that, but um, very kindly, Janine Finn has um, offered to come back, even though we dropped the ball, and speak on um, at our May 16th meeting, and she's going to be talking about FOIA. So we can take what we just learned here from Meg and apply it, um, you know, bring it to Janine's discussion as, as Janine's talk as well. All right, anybody? Anything really at this point, you can, if it's a subcommittee update or a question or just something completely different, please um, feel free to, to hold forth. 
All right. Well, um, I guess that's it then. Um, Meg, once again, thank you so much. That really was so helpful. I took so many notes and I can see that Brandon also took really great notes. So um, we'll get those up on the wiki so that other people can see them. And um, the um, DLFL, DLF folks very kindly um, recorded this for us. So they will put, we'll put it up on YouTube and also share that on the wiki so that people who couldn't make it today can watch it. So thank you guys. Um, so much and um, Meg put a comment in the chat that if you she's on the listserv her email is available so if you have any questions feel free to either put them on the list uh, to put them on the listserv and she will follow up um, to answer them all right thanks so much guys see you all again our next meeting is May 16th um, I don't know the time off the top of my head although I could probably find it if you give me just a second uh, oh, actually, I, I don't know. Oh, there it is. Um, May 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. So we will hopefully um, see you all then. Thank you so much. And thanks again, Meg. Thank you. Thank you for having me.